we are very happy to be here. And uh, I am particularly happy because I know that here people are not going to say, theoretical biology, what is it? So <laughs> we can enter into matter immediately. Um, thank you, Mael. So we are going to use carcinogenesis as the theme, but in reality we are going to talk about the theory of organisms as well. So I will start with the problem of cancer because it's a very important health problem. And uh, in 1914, the embryologist Theodore Bobiri noticed that carcinogenesis, unlike organogenesis, cannot be observed in statu nascendi. So we don't see it, how it happens, until it becomes visible, that is much, much later, say, 20 years afterwards. So, um, even if we use animal models, like the one I'm describing there, that is a mammary gland of a rat, and a chemical carcinogen, we do not see it until much later than, uh, you know, like 20 one days, one month after we apply the chemical carcinogen. So, that poses a problem. And this fact provides an excellent reason to assess the implicit and explicit perspective, assumptions, theories, and hunches that contribute to experimental design. And I should say that since many decades, the problem in biology is that we have abandoned theory, not us, but the field in general. And that poses a very big problem. So going back to what is going on in cancer, the field uh, hasn't improved that much in the century and two decades later after what uh, Boveri had to say. And the problem is the following. For many years now, people talk about driver mutations as being the cause for cancer, and they are found in tissues of healthy adult people that would never become cancerous. Additionally, if mutation is the cause of cancer, at least said since the time of Boberi, then we have a little problem there because there are mutation-free cancers that occur in many circumstances, but the most typical example is an ependymomas of the posterior fossa of the brain. And as a corollary of this lack of fit, the sequencing effort continues to search for additional mutations. So you see that there is a problem there, a very serious problem. So we are in a virtuous circle where the theory doesn't work, which, by the way, is a very loose theory. It's not a real theory. It's a, very, it's a way of thinking only. And uh, so what to do? And so we think we have a solution. So how do we get out of this dead end? So we think that it's time for a new theory, that biology has to embrace theory, serious theories, precise theories. Why? Scientific theories provide organizing principles and construct objectivity by framing observations and experiments. The theory determines which are the proper observables. I mean, if you are in classic mechanics, the uh, atom is not an observable, okay? So we have to be strict as physicists because otherwise the theory is just a hunch and can never be proven wrong. So the choice of observables is a major theoretical commitment, and a good theory should be precise, as it says, so it can be rejected, and its principles could be used to frame mathematical modeling. But we are facing a problem that I mentioned, that is the decline of theorization in the current sciences. And this is, uh, Mael is uh, in the editorial board of Philosophy World Democracy, and we have published an issue on this subject. I mean, one of the papers, I am the author, so I'm happy. <laughs> so um, I think that uh, we have to use, now, in order to recreate theory in biology, we should have the help of physics, because physics is very theory theory rich. So we have to establish a theoretical transition from physics to biology, 
because although physics is very rich in theory and can help us to develop testable theories, on the other hand, the two fields are different, one being concerned with the inert and the other being concerned with the alive. So the first thing we had to do in our theory of organisms, of which Miles is going to talk later on, is defining a limit case, as it was done in uh, classical mechanics. So we have to establish the com a comparable thing to the principle of inertia that we call the default state or the constitutive state of cells. We have to have awareness that biology is about change, and thus two important aspects of physics do not apply to biology. One is the existence of a predetermined phase space, and the other is that we don't have invariance and symmetry conservation. We should say in biology is all about change. And also in biology, we have circular causality, because there is an interdependency between the organism and its parts. And so that is not the way of physics and of mechanism. That is what biologists think they know how to study. Thus, mathematical modeling biology requires rethinking so that we can really model from principles. And that is what we are doing. Awareness that biological objects are goal-directed normative agents is also very important. We have to accept and think that organisms are goal-directed. They try to keep themselves alive. We live in a precarious world where we have to provide food. That's even for a bacterium, that is true. Organisms are agents and so capable to generate action means also capable to take decisions, even for those that don't have a brain. Organisms, therefore, are normative, and they create their own rules. And I'll give you an example, and then Mael will continue with our principles for a theory of organisms. So this goat was born with paralysis of the anterior legs, and uh, you see that she is able to walk like humans. So she's not jumping, she's just walking. That is normative agency demonstrated in a just uh, short clip. So, and in the case of the goat, what happens is that there, is, uh, there are organizational changes of the bones, the muscles, and so on, so that Anatomically, it, it is somewhat similar to human. It shows the plasticity of development and the ability of living beings to create norms at the level of individuals, uh, which is not in line with the classical theory of genetic determinism. So, concerning now that we have said all that, uh, we have to discuss a bit how to move forward and uh, propose principles for a theory of organisms. So those are not meant to be complete, but they are a sound uh, starting point. So the first principle uh, that we have proposed is to, to propose a limit state, uh, which we have called the default state, and is alike to inertia from classical mechanics, but for cells. And uh, unlike inertia, where basically to have a change of movement, you need for external forces, uh, we stated that spontaneously cells will move and proliferate. So the, the default state for cells is a state where cells are agents um, and where they generate their own role. Now, the second principle that we have called the principle of variation, but we, we might have well uh, called it the principle of historicity, um, states that Biology is, and biological objects are primarily changing, and then invariance comes, comes second. So it's a way to further specify the randomness that Darwin brought up. So the, the main consequences of this principle is the, con is the concept of historicity, contextuality, and variability. Now, of course, it doesn't entail that there will be no invariance in biology at all but invariants are limited in time, in scope, mm -hmm. and we call them constraints to, different gem, to differentiate them from um, 
um, physics laws, for example, which are, have a different epistemological status. So now we have, invari we have invariants, we have constraints, but the constraints need then to be explained, and their stability you know, requires an explanation. And for that, we have the principle of organization, uh, notably in the form of closure of constraints that Matteo, Mosio, and I have developed, and it's the idea that constraints mutually maintain each other in an organism. But that can be extended also, for, uh, for example, to ecosystems. So then we have three principles to, to move forward. And now let's go back to cancer biology. So to, to, to give a new view, a new uh, look uh, to cancer biology, we, we first, first should uh, have a look at uh, normal development, in a sense. And, um, and uh, this experiment is a very uh, interesting one in that regard. So what happens is that the experimenter, Sakakura, transplanted the epithelium of a mammary gland in the stroma of a salivary gland and uh, the other way around. And what happens is that, ultimately, it's the stroma that determines the shape of the epithelium. So it is not the case that uh, the, the epithelium will determine it, its shape by itself, as if following a program, but instead it's a reciprocal interaction between the epithelium and the stroma that leads to the shape. So this can get more fancy in the case of uh, kidney organogenesis. So if we take uh, uh, the epithelium and the, the, me the mesenchyme alone, they don't do any kind of morphogenesis, but together they produce this complex shape, and then in return these complex shapes lead to cellular differentiation. So the cells change, and here you have historicity too at the level of the organism, inside the organism. So now we can come back to cancer and uh, raise the question of what a neoplasm is. That is to say, basically, a cancerous tumor. So the neoplasm, if we uh, take a step back from the usual rationale about mutation, is primarily altered tissue organization. And here you have an illustration of that. And an excessive accumulation of cells. And in practice, and still nowadays, even though there are markers and so on, Neoplasms are diagnosed by pathologists and only by the pathologists using light microscopes. So now I give the floor back to Anna. Merci. Okay, so uh, based on our theory of organisms, we have also developed a theory for carcinogenesis that you call, we call it uh, the tissue organization field theory of carcinogenesis that Carlos Sonnenschein and I proposed in 1999. And in it, we say that the tissue is the target of carcinogen. And so here you have a tissue that is an epithelium and a connective tissue that is supporting, or stroma that is uh, supporting it. But as Mael said, the stroma determines the uh, morphology and function of the epithelium. So therefore, if uh, what we propose here is that uh, the carcinogen, be it radiation or, or chemical um, or biological, will affect the uh, stroma and therefore alter the reciprocal interactions between epithelium and stroma that are depicted as double-headed arrows. And when this happens, this epithelium is less constrained, so the cells there can uh, start manifesting their default state of proliferation and motility. As a result of that, they gain more cells. They become a structure that is a metaplasia, and finally a carcinoma in situ, and even a, a, a big cancer eventually. And so the thing happens, cancer happens at the tissue level of organization. So it's a kin of organogenesis. The targets are tissues. It's a problem of tissue organization, like embryogenesis. And the default state of cells of proliferation with variation and motility is now released from constraints. And so we don't need to explain that cells will proliferate and move they will do that when they are not constrained. And proliferation appears in cancer, and movement is invasion and metastasis. 
So by releasing constraints, all this happens. So this theory now is being applied to study carcinogenesis, and we will show uh, a, an example of that. So the question was to test the idea that the target of carcinogens is the stroma. That is our theory. But at the same time, in order to make the test theory neutral, we also tested whether or not the epithelium was the target of carcinogenesis. That is what the somatic mutation theory says. So we designed this experiment. Here we have the epithelium and the stroma of a mammary gland. So we dissociate them, and uh, we apply carcinogen, or the buffer vehicle, to the stroma and to the epithelium. And when the, the carcinogen is metabolized, we recombine those tissues, and we test that in vivo. And so this is what we observe, that tumors only develop in animals treated with a carcinogen. Well, here you have the control. Oh, I cannot. Ooh, I'm, I'm blasting the, the, the people with the, 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 the laser, so I better don't use it. So let's go from right to left now. Negative control, animal injected with buffer. Positive control, animal injected with the carcinogen. Now we go from left to right. If we treat the stroma with carcinogen and the epithelium with vehicle, 180% tumors appear. If we treat with carcinogen both, tumors appear. But when you treat the epithelium with carcinogen and the stroma with vehicle, zero tumors appear. So it does not, it's not consistent with the somatic mutation theory, but it's consistent with our tissue organization field theory. And of course, vehicle doesn't do anything. And you see that the tumor that appears in those animals in which the stroma was affected are big, macroscopic, and uh, are real tumors. Now, we said, fine. Now, if cancer appears when you alter these reciprocal relations, then cancer can be reversed. And we know clinically that is the case of several cancers. For example, neuroblastoma in children is uh, a, a tumor that regresses quite frequently. And so we decided to test whether these uh, uh, tumors can uh, be controlled by normal tissues, as it happened in neuroblastomas in people. So we took the primary tumor, and we dissociated the epithelial cells and the stroma, and took the epithelial cells and injected it in the denudated stroma of the mammary gland of uh, mice. And so what we have there is that if the animals are young, as you see, at 27 days of age or at 52 days of age, the cells from the tumor give rise to tumors. But if we take old animals, that is, animals that if we inject with carcinogens do not develop tumors, the cells of the primary tumor that were so-called cancer cells form perfectly normal ducts. So cancer can be reversed. So to sum the situation up concerning uh, cancer biology, um, cells in the wrong uh, morphogenetic field, that is to say with uh, the wrong stroma, can generate a process akin to carcinogenesis. And reciprocally, uh, tumor cells put uh, in, uh, in the right context uh, could revert, and this, this is called cancer normalization. So these two phenomena that do not fit with uh, the somatic mutation theory uh, point also to therapeutic solutions. But to conclude also more, bro more broadly, uh, theories determine uh, the observables, the possible, and even the imaginable, because cancer normalization is not imaginable in somatic, somatic mutation theory. We didn't develop that too much, but theory also provides a framework for mathematical modeling, what can be done, with it, and what is also imaginable doing with it. And at this level, uh, our theory raises both challenges and opportunities, um, so both for mathematical modeling and for experiments. And to conclude, we are confident that the theoretical principles we propose offer a way out of the current stasis, both in cancer research and in biology in general. And we would like to acknowledge our uh, 
theoretical collaborators in the organism groups, also uh, the experimenters in uh, the laboratory in Tufts, and the various foundations and institutions that support our work. Thank you for your attention.